We are going to get started, and this is kind of going to be the tenor of the panel discussion of talking to these amazing scientists um, in this very like casual, low-key kind of way, except when they throw out terms that Dean just threw out that I have literally no idea what he said. So I am going to start today. This is our second in our series of CRIP Conversations, Disability Culture and Disability Studies. My name is Dr. Nick Winges Yanez. I coordinate the critical disability studies here at UT Austin. Um, we have this series that just last year started to be year long versus a month long to kind of incorporate different conversations to talk to more people, have different topics kind of happening. So during this time, uh, now that we are also virtual, it's really kind of awesome because I get to have folks who are not in Austin speak with us, which is another benefit, I think, of kind of going virtual as being able to reach outside of our geographical region to reach out to people who we might not have been able to hear from before. So that's really cool. Um, and I always like to start our panel with an accessibility note. So we do have closed captions at the bottom of the screen. If you would like to start those, you are welcome to. We have ASL interpretation happening. So they are part of the gallery. You can see those as well. Um, I also like to do a visual description of myself before we get started, which is always kind of fun. I always find them kind of interesting when people do visual descriptions of themselves. So I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I am a white woman who has bleached blonde and fuchsia hair. Um, I have a black top on, I have headphones on that make me look super cool. I have blue rimmed eyeglasses with a privacy screen behind me and bookshelves behind me as well um, to minimize the, the family members who will be walking back and forth behind me. Um, and so that is my visual description. We are here to talk to three amazing scientists who I've had the joy of getting to know over the last few months. Um, we are going to be talking to Dr. Dean Tantillo from UC Davis. We are talking to Do Dr. Eric Anslin from UT Austin and Dr. Hobie Wedler from Sense Point Design, also in California. Um, and I'm going to let them all introduce themselves individually. And we will start with Dr. Hobie Wedler. Well, thank you very much, Nick. Um, you know, it really is an honor to uh, to be able to join you virtually today. I wish that uh, that I was in Austin because I love the city of Austin. It's a it's a beautiful place, a wonderful place to spend time. But uh, in spite of what's going on, very excited to uh, to join you all virtually. Um, as as I was introduced, I'm Hobie, and uh, been totally blind since birth. I really think of myself as an explorer, someone who likes to really do as much as I can to get other people excited about things maybe they didn't know they were excited about. I really uh, have the heart of a teacher in everything that I do. Um, and these presentations, which I get to co-deliver with my uh, most trusted mentor and graduate advisor, Dr. Dean Tantillo, are really a highlight of my career because we get to, uh, to chat a little bit about how we, how we made chemistry accessible. And I have not had the opportunity uh, until today to present with Professor Anslin. And uh, it's an incredible honor and, uh, and joy to be doing that as well. I, I admire Eric a lot and uh, it's, it's, it's an honor to share the, uh, the, the panel table with him as well. Um, I got my PhD in computational organic chemistry from uh, Dean in, at UC Davis. And uh, basically I, we study computation, applied computational organic chemistry I'll let Dean explain a little more of what the, what the group does uh, momentarily. And uh, really the, the goal of getting a PhD was to try to inspire others to study science and get excited about whatever it is they were passionate about. Um, I remember when I was an undergraduate, my dream, I'm, I'm a nerd and uh, that, that should be uh, disclosed right now, but my dream was to uh, teach, you know, was to, to walk into the, organic, the general chemistry classroom uh, at 8 a.m. on Monday morning as, a, as an instructor or professor, maybe after Halloween weekend or one of those weekends when everyone is partying way more than they should be, and take that opportunity to change some students' minds about science and make chemistry really exciting. 
Um, I did have the, the opportunity to teach quite a bit while doing research in graduate school. My graduate career was a combination of um, doing really exciting organic chemistry research with Dean, as well as figuring out how we would make that research accessible to me. There were some barriers associated with teaching chemistry. And uh, actually, while in graduate school, Dean was kind enough to let me explore other avenues and I, uh, while, you know, while working because my laptop was my laboratory, which is a convenience of computational chemistry. So I actually did a lot of work with Francis Ford Coppola Winery and uh, plenty of other food and beverage brands, uh, doing work, under, uh, helping people understand the world while temporarily removing eyesight. Uh, this led to an entrepreneurial sort of career where I uh, started SensePoint in 2017, um, essentially performing sensory design for clients and allowing them to understand the world uh, non-visually. Uh, we now have, uh, I guess, four companies floating around. We have uh, SensePoint and uh, a, a spinoff of SensePoint that specifically focuses on food and drink called Tucker Branding. I also, uh, am, uh, this is forthcoming, but we're, uh, we're launching a, a rub and spice business to elevate uh, cooking in the home kitchen. Uh, launched a, uh, a brand, well, built a brand, uh, actually a spirits brand of vodka and gin about a year and a half ago, which we are finally resurrecting because we found some funding for it recently. And this is just a little passion project of mine, which is going great. I, uh, I have a, a, a set of clients currently uh, where I mentor uh, blind students and their parents and ultimately find a uh, really exciting, hopefully, and uh, customized path to success for their children. And we really instill high expectations as much as we can in both parents and their children to really allow for that opportunity for kids to advocate for themselves. I like to say by education rather than litigation. So that's me in a strange nutshell. Thank you so much, Hobie. There's so many questions that I have. Um, probably after this panel, I will ask about the rub and spice. So we'll save that for later. Um, Dr. Tantillo, would you like to go next? Sure. I uh, hope you're already impressed with Hobie. Uh, I am I'm just a chemistry professor at UC Davis. Uh, I was Hobie's PhD advisor, and I've known Hobie for a long time and been inspired by him for a long time. And I don't want to take any more time away from Hobie. So, <laughs> Dr. Eric Anslin, with such modesty with these. Okay. That was short and sweet, yeah. Dean. Um, yeah, so I'm Eric Antlin. I'm an organic chemist, well, just an organic chemistry professor also here at UT Austin. Um, I got to know Hobie when I was coming out being hosted by Dean during a seminar visit at UC Davis uh, many years ago and just thought he was a remarkable individual and uh, Hobie, but Dean is also a remarkable individual and uh, have you know, kept up with what Hobie's been up to. I thought it was fun for a second there that we sh might give visuals. Okay, so I'm 60 years old. I've got a big gray beard. I'm losing my hair in the front. I'm trying to grow it long in the back to balance. Um, and I wear John Lennon glasses. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I love that description. <laughs> See, giving descriptions are really kind of fun, right? Okay, so. Again, a lot of modesty here. We have some, I mean, organic chemistry in of itself is just like, I, I can't speak on it. I can't speak on it. Um, so we have some amazing people who are going to speak on it. But we were going to get started with Hobie kind of talking about your journey into chemistry, kind of what that looked like, what led you there. Um, and then we can kind of organically start to go into some other conversations around that entry point. Does that make sense? Sounds great. Okay, so take these, it away. These guys are far too modest. Uh, they do amazing work. Um, they're some of my most trusted mentors and advisors and uh, just wanna, for the record, say that uh, they're far too modest and you're, I really am excited for you to know a lot about, uh, about Dean and Eric's work throughout the course of the hour. Wow, where did, uh, how did, how did this journey begin? As a kid, I always was fascinated with how things work and how things fit together. You know, it's kind of amazing when you think about it, when you're, when you're young and you're thinking about the world, 
that when you turn the tap on in your kitchen sink, assuming that you live in a municipality that provides water other than well water, water comes out of that tap. Where the heck does that water come from? So it's being pressurized at some central point throughout the city and then piped all over the place. It's got a fascination for plumbing and electricity and just sort of how things fit together. And my parents were amazing at, and still are amazing at, at explaining these fascinations and curiosities. You know, I was chatting with, uh, with my parents a couple of days ago just about this, uh, this panel that we were doing. And, and they said, you know, one thing that, that you should make clear is that uh, as, a, as a parent of a blind child, you know, the, the most successful parents really are always tour guides, always explaining what they see in the world around them, um, maybe even before I knew to ask about it. And uh, this, I think, is what really led me to appreciate science and nature and everything around me, which is ultimately, to, to go full circle, uh, what, what I was able to, to study and, and sink my, my, my mind into uh, in Dean's group, thinking about uh, terpene chemistry, which we'll get into in a minute. Terpene chemistry falls all over nature, all over the natural world around us. And Dean opened my eyes, no pun intended there, to the, uh, the magic of terpene chemistry. Um, you know, I think I, that I, pun was intended. Oh, maybe it was. But, uh, <laughs> oh, but uh, it was in my freshman year of high school when I realized that, uh, that chemistry was something that I just really enjoyed. And I knew at that point that I wanted to take honors chemistry as a junior. I went to the instructor who happened to be the same person who taught me freshman physical science who taught honors chemistry and said, hey, you know, I really want to take your class. She said, well, I'll see if you test into it. So I took the test and tested into it. It was okay. And uh, she said, God, I don't know how you're going to do lab work. This is just too much of a risk. And I said, well, let's find someone who's taken the class before me and, uh, and figure out how to, you know, let them be my eyes in the laboratory and uh, write my answers down on exams that I, that I give them. Um, and, and I think it'll be fine. So we found a great person worked out okay, but the, the instructor, who's someone I really admire and now totally consider one of my allies, would always talk about, yeah, you know, you guys really understand that chemistry is the science that dictates how the, how the world works. It's how we breathe. It's what we eat and drink. You know, all these things rely on chemistry. The physicists argue with me when I, when I make that claim, but I'll make it anyway, that, that chemistry really, really describes the world around us. And she would talk to the students about, you, know, you should think about going into careers in chemistry. Then I would approach her after class and, you know, when, when no other students were, were around and say, you know, I, I really want to pursue this. How, how do I go about it? She would say, well, it's a, it's a really visual field. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know how you're going to infer the, the data that you need to infer to be a, to be a chemist in, in college. I'm really sorry to say. I thought, okay, there's got to be a way around this. I got to figure out how to get her to understand that chemistry is something that we can all do. And I still remember the day, it was the second week of the second semester. I think it was midweek, I think it was even a Wednesday. And I walked into a room before school started. I didn't have class until about 11 a.m. But I, I just had to, had to share this with her. And I said, you know, I understand that you think chemistry is too visual, but I have to tell you that nobody can see atoms. And that really changed her mind. And she understood and became a, a true ally of mine. And I think that's very true that, you know, we can't see what's going on chemically. Maybe we use our eyes to look for color changes or phase changes or any, any number of things that we might see that, that occur in a, in a reaction when doing, in a, in a you know, reaction flask when doing, doing experimental chemistry. But the, the facts of what's happening at a molecular and an atomic level are really cerebral. So this inspired me to go to college and study chemistry. I also did my undergraduate studies at UC Davis and uh, had a really amazing assistant who I worked with there. I was lucky enough to work with her all the way from the beginning of my freshman year until I graduated out of Dean's group in, uh, in 2016. Um, and, and that really, really helped tremendously. Dean and I actually met in 2009 and, uh, you know, I'd say that one thing that mentors do, mentors do so many things for us, but one thing that um, I think my most trusted mentors have done for me time and time again is they see a future for us before we see that future for ourselves. 
and they coax and they guide and they allow us to understand that future slowly but surely. So Dean invited me in the summer of 2009 to enter his group and just try doing computational chemistry. And I, I did it. I was excited to have a, a research position. A lot of my peers had research positions and uh, it, during the summers, uh, undergraduate research positions. And I just thought, wow, this is, this is an opportunity. I'm, I'm inspired. I'm honored to be invited into, into this research group. And I, um, with a few in-house scripts that we wrote and uh, much great assistance from Dean and, and other uh, group members, we were able to make a lot of the research that on that summer project quite accessible to me. We'll get into some of the ways that we made chemistry accessible a bit later, but um, that inspired me to finish up my undergraduate tenure. I worked in Dean's group uh, throughout the school year and throughout the next couple of summers, just to make sure that, uh, you know, that we were still able to make things accessible to me. One of my big things is that I don't, I don't want to have a whole bunch of assistance if I, if I don't need to. So part of the goal for me in studying computational chemistry was to figure out how to make it as accessible as possible with you know, as, as minimal sighted assistance as possible. And Dean eventually had a chat with me in uh, early, well, late 2010, where he, he said, you know, you should really think about applying to graduate school and, and studying in my lab. And I was flattered and honored that he would, uh, he would consider that option and uh, applied to graduate school and, and ultimately got in and was able to, uh, to sit in Dean's group uh, for the entirety of my graduate tenure, uh, where we did a lot of really exciting work together, uh, both on, as I said before, computational chemistry and on um, how, to, how to make a lot of the projects that we did uh, as accessible as possible to me with, uh, with you know, some sided assistance, but as uh, ideally minimal sided assistance. Um, and I, I really do think that, that the way that I think about chemistry is just the same way that I, I, I think about, it's the same way that I visualize uh, things that you might see as sided people around you. So I feel like I use the same part of my brain and Dean and I want to research this at some point, but uh, I feel like I use the same part of my brain to solve complex organic chemistry problems that I use sort of for my survival as a blind traveler. So that's, that's the that's sort of how we got started. And it's just been a, a wonderful journey that, uh, that I've been humbled and honored to be on um, ever since the beginning. So uh, thank you to, to Dean for making it all, making it all possible. And, uh, showing me that path that maybe I didn't know existed. I love that story when you're talking about we can't and it was like this like huge light bulb moment for other people. <laughs> and I think that that's true for various, various sciences. And I think that's just such an elegant way to, to state it. Now through that whole awesome story when you were talking about water, I was like, I never questioned water, but now I do question water. Thank you so much, Hobie. Um, but through this whole discussion, you kept bringing up Dr. Tantillo, who, who was extremely modest in his introduction, but we can see how integral he was to kind of your journey. And so if I could throw it to Dean to kind of talk about what it was like when you met him in 2009 and kind of what your thoughts were. Yeah, sure. Um... Hobie's always very modest and complimentary, um, but right back at him. I mean, I think he's, uh, he's awesome. So <clears throat> when I first met Hobie, he kind of uh, came to me by way of another colleague named Jared Shaw, who he had been talking to about, um, could, could he do some kind of research? And I think Jared had suggested that he talk to me because uh, we don't blow things up, and which is the main reason I switched from experimental chemistry to computational chemistry. <clears throat> and, and Jared had made a suggestion like, oh, he, maybe we can build this robot that'll put, you know, balls and sticks together to make pictures of molecules. And I said, well, let's just get a 3D printer because um, that's that's what people do for that sort of thing nowadays. And so that was, you know, once we sort of realized that, well, maybe with 3D printing, we could uh, uh, give Hobie a visualization that he could read with his hands instead of his eyes, then that basically opened the door to everything. So I always say the same same thing that Hobie reminded me that uh, visualization and vision are not the same thing. 
organic chemistry is a very visual science, but it's not dependent on actually being able to see things. You need to be able to visualize things in your head. Um, and, and actually that's probably the most important thing for being at least a good computational organic chemist. Um, so most of what we did, you know, Hobie's PhD was really a combination of him doing primary uh, uh, research on computational organic chemistry, along with <clears throat> trying to develop some new tools to make um, that process accessible to him. And, you know, a lot of that had to do with 3D printing. So what we do is we can calculate using quantum chemistry, the structures of molecules. And the students in my group will generally then open up a, a window on their computer and they'll get an image of a ball and stick uh, picture of a molecule where the balls are the atoms and the sticks are the bonds and rotate that around. Well, it doesn't work for Hobie, but so what we did instead was, uh, you know, work on methods to actually print out a ball and stick model of his, his structure that he calculated with quantum mechanics so that he could hold it with his hands. Um, and ultimately we got to a point where we were <clears throat> printing um, braille labels on the bonds to show their distances and different textures on the atoms so you could tell what's a carbon and what's an oxygen and and things like that and that sort of problem solving was was a ton of fun in addition to the more straight chemistry problem solving as well so yeah I mean I think it was uh, it was great uh, for me and it continues to be great for me to talk to Hobie because you know whenever someone can get you to step out of your viewpoint to see see the world from a, a different viewpoint something productive for me anyway always comes from that and the other thing i always say uh, is that uh, there's something called the hobie rule that anything we develop for him should be useful to everyone else as well and so you know 3d printing of computed structures is useful to sighted chemists as well as chemists who don't have sight who don't have vision so um that, that's uh, also a big part of it and sort of also shows you that Hobie cares about uh, not just himself and improving things for other people as well. You know, Dean, just to, to piggyback on that, on that rule, you know, <laughs> I, I like the God Hobie's rule. It's, it's, it's fun. Um, no, but it's, it really is, if you think about it, just in terms of accessibility to, to sort of generalize the conversation a little bit, you know, let's take something like a, like a wheelchair ramp or as some people call them curb cuts. Um, you know, Ed Roberts in the 19, the late 1960s and early 1970s and uh, about 10 of his colleagues at UC Berkeley all in wheelchairs called themselves the rolling squad. And they would all roll down to City Hall every week and talk to the mayor of Berkeley and say, you know, it's a real drag when we're sitting trying to cross a street and we have to wait for someone to help lower our wheelchairs down into the street level so that we can just get across a simple street. It would really make sense to put in some ramps that we could roll up and down. And the mayor of Berkeley then was cranky and talked about how, how it's so expensive. It's only gonna help such a small group of people. And through time, they were able to convince the city of Berkeley to do it, it made sense. And the state of California did it. And, and ultimately it was uh, mandated by George H.W. Bush's, uh, well, I shouldn't give him full credit, but he definitely deserves some Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. Uh, that everywhere in the country have wheelchair ramps. But let's just think about how many of us use wheelchair ramps. I read an article a few months ago that said, I think 5% of the total use, maybe even less than 5% of the total use of wheelchair ramps is done by people in wheelchairs. Think about driving a, you know, pushing a shopping cart full of groceries out to your car. You don't, you don't wanna push it off the curb. You wanna roll it down the ramp pushing a baby stroller. I don't know what parents did before curb cuts were around. You know, that's a little dangerous. Riding a bike, rolling a, rolling a suitcase, you know, you name it, riding a skateboard. So one thing intended to help one group of people helped the world revolutionize itself. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of like when we're thinking about universal design in architecture, but also universal design and learning is kind of thinking about we're thinking about, you know, a few folks, but how can it expand to help everyone in some way? And I remember when I was talking to you guys at some point in the summer, and I think, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Dean, and you were talking about teaching and kind of how it had to change the way you taught, um, which was you said it was helpful, but how did it change other ways of like just how you pedagogically moved forward 
yeah um it, it's not really putting me on the spot uh, hobie and i have even written about this in papers um you know hobie was an undergrad in in my department and so a lot of people uh, had him in class and just about all of them have told me the same thing that that they felt like their teaching improved for having hobie in the class and that was for a couple of reasons i think one was that uh, chemists who are and i'm sure it's not particularly chemists but chemists who are excited about the chemistry they're teaching tend to go through it really quickly and 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 uh that's hard for students we, sometimes we forget that any student it, it doesn't have the background we have so first of all uh, Hobie was great at, at making you slow down. And I, and I don't mean his presence. I mean, he would tell you to slow down, <laughs> which is a good thing. And everybody benefited from that. Also, it made, for me, it made my language uh, more precise and more complete. So instead of saying, you know, that part of the molecule over there, I would, I would be explicit about that C carbon oxygen bond that's two, two atoms away from that nitrogen. Um, for example. Um, and again, all of those things just uh, led to, I think, greater clarity in presentation that was uh, beneficial to, to all the students. I mean, I think often, uh, you know, I keep trying to remind myself what it was like to take classes as a student. But the older you get, the harder it is to remember that. Um, so it's good to kind of have a, a reminder of that, that, you know, where, where you know, things I might skip over because they're obvious to me are not obvious to anyone. And so a lot of students are unwilling to, to tell you that and ask you to slow down or ask you to explain things. And I try to welcome that, but a lot of that is because, uh, because Hobie was very demanding <laughs> in, in, a, in a very good way. So I joke about that, but the thing that was great about Hobie is that um, one of the things that's great about Hobie is, is that uh, he was very straightforward about what would be helpful to him. And I know Ho Hobie really believes in advocating for yourself. Uh, and I think that's, that's super important because a lot of times you'll have a professor who wants to help but has no idea how to help. You know, Hobie was the first blind student that I ever had in class, but he was great about telling me what, what would be helpful. And that was a, a big part of, of implementing change that has stuck with me long after Hobie has graduated. Dean is a poet, by the way, when it comes to describing organic molecules, uh, about the best in the business. And, and there's really a, uh, an amazing art to, uh, to knowing how to speak chemistry. Um, you know, I think that's, I think that's really, really Actually, important. It was interesting. I, at our research group meetings, I would often find myself translating for my students into the language of the molecule that I knew Hobie would get quickly. <laughs> no, it was, which was really, is also really great for me to sort of uh, develop a specific skill like that. <laughs> so helpful. Dean, you know, one, one thing that you mentioned and, uh, and I, I thank you for this, that, you know, I, I, I was able to explain pretty well what worked and what didn't work. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of controversy about, about advocacy and, um, I'm afraid that I see a lot of students advocating for themselves by saying, this problem is not solved, but not arriving at the table with a suitable solution. Now, a suitable solution can be, hey, I don't know, let's work together to figure this out. But it's never a good solution to just say, this is wrong, this is a problem, and get you know, and, and start to litigate. And that's what I see. And, and that's the, what scares colleges and universities, I think, sometimes about, and it's a bit controversial what I'm about to say, but makes them nervous to have and accommodate students with disabilities. So what I would just be suggesting, if there's any, if, if there's anything that I, I would, I would hope that you would take away from any remarks that I make today, it's that you can advocate for yourself by really just teaching people and showing people what works for you rather than saying, no, 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 this is wrong and not coming to the table with a solution. So there were a lot of times when Dean said, what would make this, what would make this better? And I would say, well, I don't know, but let's, let's figure it out together. And then it, then it becomes not a worry to work with someone with a dis disability. I hope that what it becomes is a challenge and, and maybe even an excitement. So it's just an important lesson, I think, about self-advocacy. And I would say this to anyone 
regardless of whether you have a disability or not. What I've learned by being someone who, who lacks eyesight is it's just important to help people work with people. Well, let me restate that. As someone without eyesight, I've learned that it's important to work with everybody. And, and I think this is important for all of us to do to find that solution. And sometimes it'll take months to find the solution that makes sense, but there's always one out there. And if we can collaborate rather than be adversaries as we're arriving at that, at that solution, I think we're all winning so much more. And I think that, so I wanna kind of pivot off of that. Thank you, Hobie. And I've heard this from other students and I invite Dr. Eric Anslin in as well to this conversation of, so we're talking about students self-advocating um, for finding solutions. However, there is the necessity for faculty and instructors to kind of be willing to engage in that conversation as well. And that kind of has been at times an issue for many folks um, where students come in contact with faculty who are like, there's just no way, or if you need accommodations, this is something I've heard from students, if you need accommodations to this point, then you should not be taking this class. And I wonder like how, and I'm speaking specifically to Dean and Eric here, when someone comes to you, what is the mindset or kind of the paradigm of how to move forward? Or what would you tell your colleagues if someone comes to you with this kind of question and curiosity of how can we make this accessible? Eric, you're mute. muted. I sure was, thank you. You didn't wanna hear me coughing earlier. That's why I muted. Um, yeah, I'm certainly highly encouraging in my class of advocacy, continually inquiring um, both over emails I send to the whole class, but right in the class of, you know, what, how could I present this better? Do you have any questions? What can I do to make this clearer concept? Um, so it's just part of being a teacher in my own opinion. So advocacy related to how to enable the material to be better grasped by an individual with any kind of disability, again, I would strongly encourage, I imagine the vast majority of my colleagues would encourage that also. Um, you know, in my classes, I've had some people with uh, hearing or visual kinds of imperities. We've always worked out a solution of how to handle this. So I would say, I think STEM individuals are very open to trying to bring in individuals that I would say have various kinds of disabilities. My last thought here is, you know, this all comes into a diversity, equity and inclusion kind of, you know, overtone. And currently, uh, academics is discussing extensively how to make the material we teach, you know, better fit a DEI mindset. And so I just want to give one example, but it's the kind of example that, again, I'm encouraging or stating that it's the kind of thing I try to consider when teaching. Um, Hobie and Dean will probably know this. I commonly show a photo from like 1927 of what was called the Solvay Conference, a bunch of very famous chemists and physicists. Einstein is among them. <laughs> um, they're all old white guys, but with one woman, one woman, Madame Curie. And I did have a student who now, again, under the idea of advocacy, did say, well, you know, I was kind of put off with that. There's absolutely nobody who looks like me. I immediately recognized, yeah, that's what I need to change. I need to show modern conferences, not a conference from 1927, a modern conference where there are people of all stripes, if I can use that terminology. So yeah, what you're asking, um, is simply just 
be open-minded and change your teaching style. And I'm delighted to do that at all times. Okay. Yeah, uh, me, me too. I think I share Eric's philosophy of asking students for feedback, even in real time. Not, not everyone is open to that, but I find that super, super helpful. Um, I would also say that, uh, you know, scientists are scientists because I like to solve challenging problems. So if you're asking for help, you should play on that. <laughs> you know, if, if you pose it as a problem to me that I, and I'm interested in it, we're, we're going to try to tackle it. So I think that that's a, a particular attack to take. But I agree with Hobie. You can't just say, well, there's a problem, fix it. I mean, I think what works best is, so how can we, can we talk about brainstorming how to fix this problem together? Um, that's a great thing. Um, I would also say that, you know, I know Hobie had this kind of experience where we went to our campus disability office, which is, has different people now and was told that he couldn't really do chemistry. They couldn't help him. So I would say don't, if one person tells you that, just don't just believe that, right? Ask around, go to, go to the people in the chemistry department, uh, search, search the internet. I mean, if you're a, a blind high school student who wants to do chemistry and everyone around you is telling you it can't be done, if you Google that, you'll probably gonna find Hobie. <laughs> and if you email Hobie, he'll, he'll chat with you on the phone, right? So, you know, don't, don't just believe the first person who tells you no, um, there's a, you know, look into it. I've, other people have probably tried to tackle these sort of similar problems before. Nick, if I may, I just want to add a, a, a fun lens to that. And, and I, I, will, I will reiterate what Dean said. I love networking and chatting with anyone and everyone, uh, whether you're a faculty member or a student or a graduate oh, sorry student. Sorry to promise that on your behalf, Hobie. No, I, that's a wonderful <laughs> thing. And, and email me anytime. Find me on LinkedIn, Hobie at HobieWedler.com or LinkedIn. Uh, get a hold of me, please, please, please. But I run a brand, I, I'm a, I don't run, I'm a partner in a branding company. And uh, I, I just want to extend this thought of diversity and inclusion into branding. And because uh, I, I, I guess Dean and Eric probably knew I would bring it here. I didn't realize it until now, but uh, we all three have at one point in our careers researched wine and um, wine chemistry. And a lot of the branding work that, that we do is in the wine industry. And one of the things that people struggle with is how to make wine more inclusive to everybody. And I use exactly, I, I've worked with many brands to help them make what they do more accessible and more inclusive and more diverse. And what I tell people is just ask questions. Ask the, the brand stewards, the customer facing people of the brand should never be opposed to saying, how can I help you better understand our wines? Or if you have someone with a disability on a tour, how can we assist you? There is no problem with asking. And that's something that Dean and Eric both do absolutely brilliantly is they ask the question. Dean was never afraid to sit down and say, how can I help you? How can we make this better? And that is of utmost importance when making the world a more diverse and inclusive space. Sorry to bring it to wine branding. I, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> it's okay. We all like wine. <laughs> yeah, I think that was great. If you're talking about, can you just like briefly talk, I remember you talked about this before and I found it just like really fascinating and it stuck with me. Um, how you make wine tasting accessible, like what about it is not accessible and how do you make it accessible? Oh man, well, let's just talk about wine tasting in general. Let's say you walk <laughs> into the into the tasting room, maybe you don't necessarily and you feel like you don't know that much about wine. The first thing is, as stewards of a wine brand, we should never be afraid to say, hey, wine is meant to be enjoyed. Just tell me what you're experiencing. Tell me what you think of this wine. If you don't like it, tell me. Nobody has to be an expert in wine to enjoy wine. Wine is humble. Wine comes from the earth. It's, it's the salt of the earth. It starts with a grape. The best winemakers can't make wine unless they have great fruit. And wine is also, by the way, a sea of organic chemistry, an amazing complex sea of organic chemistry. So what I like to do, and, and, and this is, I started this in wine, but we do this in teaching, we do this in mediation at the corporate level, we do it with food and drink of all kinds. 
it's amazing to temporarily remove eyesight with a blindfold and sit around and have a conversation around, around people and what people are doing. And then bring in something like wine to smell and taste and talk about and use as a lens to bring a group of people together. So we do a lot of that. And I still do a lot of that work because I just love it. And I think it, it helps to make the world a more inclusive space. You know, we also use blindfolds to um, teach empathy at the Waldorf High School level. So Dean and I partnered with uh, with a, an instructor of, uh, of chemistry and uh, and practical arts at a, uh, at a Waldorf, public Waldorf High School uh, here in Sonoma County to teach uh, high school students, totally sighted, able-bodied high school students, how to turn wood on a fast moving electric lathe under blindfold while being assisted by a sighted lab partner. So it's amazing what temporary removal of the sense that we use for so much of our understanding of, of the lives or, you know, of what we do and the world around us. It's amazing how much more we can understand and absorb when we take that sense away temporarily. Yeah, I'd like to say two quick things about that. If someone tells you, you, you can't do this because it's too dangerous and you're blind, tell them that Hobie says you can turn wood on a lathe. <laughs> okay. Don't quote that, me on that. <laughs> but, but that was, you know, no one hurt themselves as far as I know. Right. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, don't just assume it can't be done safely. The other thing is, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a drinker, but I have done Toby Hobie's uh, uh, tasting in the dark. He used to call it his wine tasting experience. And the most striking thing to me was that uh, there were a couple of uh, wine buyers in my group. And when you remove their site, they, they didn't really know what they were drinking. <laughs> One of them even mixed up a, a red and a white wine, um, which to me just says that, you know, we, we are, I think in general, over dependent on vision and we're not taking advantage of the other senses we have such that when that was removed, that person hadn't tuned up the other senses, which are obviously good at characterizing a wine as well. So I think that uh, that's, a, that's a big part of those sorts of experiences, reminding you that uh, not to waste all the tools you have at your disposal. I'd like to publicly offer to, uh, to Dean and Eric to do, uh, to do uh, a tasting seminar over Zoom as sort of a fun thing, lighthearted thing for your groups. So you let me know anytime you want to take me up on that. That's a fantastic idea. Yes. Pieces of expensive wine to us in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Anytime. So you had also talked a little bit about some other things that you were wanting to maybe kind of explore of, you know, ways to make the world more accessible. And first I would like to just, I love Eric, when you were talking about this black and white photo of different folks from 1927 and how that wasn't really representative of the world today. And how can we change that? Like, I just like that's just a, a fantastic comparison example of like just generalizing what we're talking about here and that this is really kind of this idea of diversity equity and inclusion across the board right like doing that across the board and highlighting that that's a lot of what science is right it's just kind of taking an issue unpacking it and figuring out like how to move forward i'm not a scientist so if that's not but, correct but i like it. that i like it Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think that that's just, I just love that so, so much. And I think right now we're having a lot of discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I think that still disability is not as integral to those discussions um, as much as they could or should be. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about how to like this is kind of what this this series is about right it's like disability is part of diversity equity and inclusion and people are not themselves kind of part of that discussion do you have any suggestions of how to kind of make sure that that is part of the discussion that that's to all three of you yeah that's a that's a hard question um i think that in my experience it generally up to this point anyway, is we're kind of required a champion. So, you know, anytime someone brings up 
DEI, I, I mentioned that, that issue, like we should be including that as well. Um, so, you know, I think the more we talk about it and the more people who get it stuck in their brain that that's a part of, of the scenario as well, the better. Um, but I think it's, I think it's hard. Yeah. Eric, sorry, I think you're going to say something. Um, well, my research group and I have discussed this topic numerous times because how can you now, this will be a chemistry term, but mm -hmm. so everybody forewarned, you know, but Hobie and Dean will know exactly what I mean. How can I teach SN1 versus SN2 in a more DEI manner. It's just, <laughs> we can all chuckle. I mean, it's just a chemical concept. Okay, but my research group, which is very diverse, so that really helps me to understand the issues, have told me, well, commonly, what you really need to do is just slow down. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, you know, Dean said that a lot, you know, maybe 40 minutes ago. Um, not that they're not implying that diversity, equity, and inclusion means people have a harder time grasping things that are going quickly, but it's simply a better way of teaching generally for everyone also helps to encompass bringing everyone in a DEI sense into the fold. That's kind of what my group has told me is the way to encourage diversity, equity, and inclusion in our classes. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to restrain myself from getting political, but I will say that <laughs> this is a great time for us all to do a lot more self-reflection mm -hmm. and about teaching as well. And I think if more people ask the question, well, if I teach it this way, am I excluding anyone or am I making it more difficult on, on anyone when I could just as easily teach it this other way, then you need to question why, why you're teaching it one way versus another. Um, perfect perfect so i think yeah i mean i think you know i have a lot of colleagues and they're great um they vary in their willingness to self-reflect <laughs> right <laughs> um, and that's just the nature of people so i mean i'm always encouraging self-reflection and my, my group and i talk about this fairly frequently um mm -hmm. yeah you know i really i i like what you both have said here about about teaching in a more dei way um i I'm going to turn it, I'm going to take a, I'm going to bifurcate, if you will, a little bit off of the points that you guys have made to use a term that uh, we you talk about when that, looking. That was for me, because my like, research involves something called a bifurcation. Yeah, when looking at potential <laughs> energy surfaces of, of reaction. So I apologize for that. But, um, you know, I, I have to say, no problem is just anyone's problem. So I, I like your question, Nick. It's a, it's a really challenging one. Um, I think, I think teachers can work to be more DEI, more inclusive, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and I'm going to throw it on the student. And I'm going to say the student also needs to do their part to self-reflect and to bring, come to the table with enough information so that they can absorb the material. This means things like reading the textbook before lecture and knowing what's going to be covered. And I would be remiss if I, if I didn't say that understanding organic chemistry as a blind person took a lot of hard work. It took, you know, I, I worked regularly in graduate school and undergraduate school 90 to 105 hours a week because you need to do that. So being blind in a sighted world requires a great deal of work. And what I want to say is that sometimes we as people with disabilities, now this is controversial, but sometimes we as people with disabilities expect those around us to do everything to make it possible for us to succeed. But the truth of the matter is, and I think it's a wonderful truth, some might consider it an inconvenient truth, but I think it's a really beautiful truth is that we have to do our part if I'm in a laboratory, an experimental laboratory class, and I come unprepared, and I just expect to sit there on my phone while my assistant does the lab for me and then spoons feed me the data, spoon feeds me the data, well, I'm not really challenging myself and I can't be 
proud of myself if and when I succeed. And on the same token, I can't punish myself if I fail. So we have to take responsibility for ourselves and we as students have to come to the table with enough information to understand when Eric explains SN1 versus SN2 to us, we need a little bit of previous context so that his job isn't made harder because we didn't do our homework. And that's, not, that's not particular to uh, people with disabilities, right? right? I mean, I think that if, if we all just agreed that it's a partnership and we both need to hold up our end of the deal, Mm -hmm. then things would be great. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but that's all in the context of, you know, we all have things going on outside of class that are putting stresses on us and, and manipulating the time we have for things. Um, so you have to try to find a system that works. And I'm always encouraging my students, you know, if this is not working for you, reach out to me and I, and I will help you to strategize on how to make it work. Uh, and I'm always a bit disappointed when not too many people take me up on that offer. Mm -hmm but I understand that there are a lot of reasons why people might not. And I also just want to, want to say one other thing to add to that Dean, which is that students, you need to remember that our instructors are the, the administrators of your department, the people cleaning the floors in your department, wherever you are at your university, we all have outside stresses that affect how we do things. It's not just you. But I think that you, I, you guys are, you said partnership Dean, which I love. But I think that within like critical disability studies, something that we often talk about is this idea of interdependence versus independence. True independence is not necessarily possible. Um, the interdependence- or For anyone, right? right? Right, right. Yeah, no, I don't cook or like I would eat Hot Pockets for my entire life because I am interdependent on my partner. So these various things that kind of exist in our world if we expand that to kind of reframe it instead of thinking about um just this very narrow view of like independence is this right instead of thinking like interdependence and working with people and kind of having these partnerships i think changes the way we move around and exist in the world but i think that's mm -hmm. also something that is very hard for many of us in the society, specifically US society, told to be very independent. Um, mm -hmm. And it's hard for folks to kind of approach instructors or faculty oftentimes because they don't want to be perceived as you know less than whatever the other students are. So there has to be a way to kind of break down those barriers of how we perceive what true um, interdependence looks like. And I think, I think it's hard to substitute for just time. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I, I end up having conversations with a lot of people who took my class a few years ago who didn't speak up in class, right, or, or approach me at the time, but then later did. You know, it, it takes some mm -hmm. time to realize that that's okay to do. Absolutely. It's a really interesting question, though, as, as to... Yeah, what a lot of times people do feel um, uh, worried, nervous about, about approaching, um, you know, people who they consider of, of authority on a subject. I, I get that. And I, I guess what I would say is someone, you know, I feel, I feel privileged in a way because I, and I need to, I need to step carefully here because my disability is, is not hidden. You know, it's very much, I wear it on my sleeve. I have a white cane in my hand. I'll, I'll tell you all about it. A little offends me. Um, but I think it's harder when, when the disability is a bit, a bit more hidden. Um, I think it can be really hard to go to someone and say, listen, this is the, this is the help I need. This is, uh, you know, like, I really, I really need to understand that. So I, I do get that, but I just want to encourage anyone, anyone who's with us today or who listens to this long in the future to not be afraid to go to someone and talk to them. And if that person gives you a hard time, as uh, one and only one professor did at Davis, who is definitely not Dean to me, you have every right to go to someone. Name. What's that? And who Dean will not name. And who Hobie will not name either. <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it, it's important to go to the, the, the people who, who pay them essentially and say, 
this didn't work. You know, I tried to reach out. So you got to be able to advocate for yourself, but don't be afraid to, to, to ask for, for help. Yeah. And some people are, are not going to respond well to that, that discussion. Mm-hmm. And so, and you have to, you know, you have to, I don't know, if you're going to be a scientist, you have to find a way to cope with rejection because you get a lot of rejection of papers you try to submit and grants you try to submit and so forth. Um, it's, but it's never easy, but I would say, you know, if, if that happens, then reach out to other people, you know, send me an email, send Hobie an email and, and we will talk you down and encourage you to, to try again. Um, just don't, in general, you, you can't let one bad apple uh, ruin it for you. And don't take it personally. That's yeah, so it's, hard. it's easy to say and very hard to do. You know, I still, still I get teaching ratings that where students say things and it's hard not to take it personally, um, <laughs> but you have to move on, right? And look for, well, okay, is there anything of substance there? Yes or no, right? So if someone is just being mean to you, well, they're not worth your time, but it's still going to hurt. Yes. Eric, Eric, I have a, just a, just a question, quick question for you. You know, you, when you give presentations, you really are, you're such an, oh, and, and Dean is this way too, but I, I've noticed this in, in, in the two um, keynotes that I've heard Eric give, you're just very open-minded and you, you just approach things in a way when you, when you talk and when you speak that just invites people not to be afraid of saying, hey, wait a minute, I didn't quite understand that. And that's in a public forum, not even in a classroom setting. How, how might you you kind of explain that, and 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 where you've where you've acquired that uh, that skill? I can tell you that's just Eric's personality. Yeah, I think I mean, so. I'll let him answer too, but but yeah, I mean, oh, some okay. people are really good at shutting down <laughs> questions. But Eric is just got an open personality where it's clear that he welcomes that. Mm-hmm. Sorry to answer for you, Eric. I just no, I'm really to- glad you answered for me because I had no idea how I was going to answer. Um, <laughs> but I think as Dean. Well, first of all, Hobie, thank you so much for the compliment. But as Dean basically stated, I'm just open, easy. I'm very easygoing. Let me put it that way. And maybe that comes forth when I'm giving talks and presentations. Mm -hmm. That's probably, Mm -hmm. it's part of inherent personality. Although, I mean, I think people can can work on that if they they want to, Uh, right? Some some people don't want to. I wish more people wanted to, but that's something you can develop if, again, if you're doing self-reflection. <laughs> right. But I think you're a natural, Eric, and I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I can I touch on, I, I, there was one thing you said a while ago that I just wanted to be able to touch on at some point before we close. And this, I mean, Dean and Hobie, noting that computational chemistry was something that would be accessible and you know, Hobie has been the exemplar uh, case study. Experimental chemistry, yeah, okay. I would love to work with someone to help them through how you would implement experimental chemistry if you're visually impaired. Yeah, it's gonna be a challenge, but uh, it was a challenge I particularly would wanna take up if someone was interested in that. Chemistry is, as Dean said, a very visual discipline. But what do we really mean by that? It's being able to visualize it in your mind and think about three dimensional structures in your mind and how those chemical structures may undergo reactions and et cetera. And I think someone who's versed at having to do all those kinds of complex manipulations, not chemistry related, but having to visualize everything in their mind continually might have a very good propensity for doing chemistry. <laughs> okay, and I'm sorry for, for those of you watching this or may listen to it later and thinking about going into the STEM sciences and thinking about mm-hmm. going into chemistry, uh, I think a propensity to be able to manipulate complex things in your mind not necessarily completely visually actually helps with chemistry. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Eric. I mean, I think it, you've already sort of practiced a, a key skill that no, no one tells you that's an important skill until, you know, you're halfway through undergrad probably. But right. 
but, but <laughs> you're right. I mean, that is a, a super valuable skill to have, especially in chemistry. Yeah. And I'll, I'll expand that to say, you know, as, as blind, as a blind person myself, you know, I just take meters and kilometers, which is how we might think about the world laid out around us and shrink those distances to angstrom, angstroms and nanometers and, uh, and use it to, to think about um, organic chemistry much the same way I think about navigating from, from my house to the, to the local bus stop. And, and my colleague, who's also blind uh, down in South Africa, Wanda Diaz, uh, applies the same general principle to cosmology. And she thinks uh, there's really not much difference between a mile and a light year and, and uses the same, the same relative skill set. So it's, it, it's applicable across numerous disciplines. That's great. So we are heading into kind of the Q&A session. So I am going to see if Kusai Hussein had raised his hand um, and I'm allowing him to talk if he's interested in asking the question. So I'm just going to leave that space open for him to ask his question. Um, Hello, everyone. You hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, we do. OK. So first of all, thank you so much to all of you for doing that. And I really enjoyed it. Uh, but um, I did ask uh, Dr. Toby if I'm saying the name right. Uh, so I, you uh, ask uh, about the student to uh, like doing work. Mm -hmm. There are people doing work, but unfortunately, like not same the dean, bro, there are some professor. The dean uh, who like kind of work with you is I could say he did phenomenal job. And thank you, Dean, for that. Uh, I will tell you a story, like short story, if Dr. Nick okay with that. And I, I need you if you can tell me how you can solve this issue a little bit. <laughs> I was taking I was taking biology class and I supposed to have accommodation letter and it's supposed to have double time on my exam. Mm -hmm. I start doing the exam and the, the professor she gave me same exactly like a other student mm -hmm. time. And then she told me your, your time is finished. And I told her, but I have accommodation. And anyway, so in the end, my score became like, got, I got B. Mm -hmm. And I follow complaint on it. Yeah. And I follow it and with the dean and everything. And then they, they did committee. And I say, okay, well, the committee will, it's all of them doctors and have PhD. I'm sure they will understand the situation and then it will, you know, solve it. I went to the room. I was looking, I thought like they are a student, not a professor. They just talking, even they don't know, tell me what, oh, who you are, what you need here. And until I ask them, are you the committee? Say, they say, yes. I said, and I told them like what happened and they asked me. And one of the head of the committee, uh, she told me, oh, Mr. Hussein, you have B and you could follow complaint. I said, yes, because I supposed to have an A, but I didn't get the time I want um, for my accommodation letter. And she told me, well, let me tell you, I have blind student last semester he fell in my class. And when she told me that I got super mad because kind of she's making comparison. And I told her, I learned two things make the student fail, the family or the professor. And maybe in your case, maybe it's you. And I left the committee. Wow. So this, this like, you, I got to the top, but they didn't understand what like accommodation letter. And this was um, I, not everything to the student, I think, in my opinion. So I just wanted to tell you that. Can, can I ask you one question? One sure. follow-up? Sure. Did your Department of Disability Resources provide the instructor with an accommodation letter? Yes. And they provided that letter before the exam? Yeah, definitely before the semester I got and I met okay. her and I gave to her and she signed it. Then you have, then you have an honest case on your hand where that instructor is absolutely at fault. Yeah. So here's, here's, what I, here's how I dealt with that. When I had a, a, a professor 
like like Dean or Eric, I would just tell them, I mean, I would always get the letter, but my disability office was often uh, not, so, not so timely, shall we say, in getting those letters out. So I would often take exams before the letter even, even hit the desk of the, of the professor. But people like Dean and Eric are gonna understand that that is the accommodation they're eventually getting the letter. Now, when I have what I would call, maybe it's a bit festive because of the time of year, a turkey professor, someone who's, who's not gonna understand these things, who I would go to at the, at the beginning of the, of the semester and say, hey, this is what we're gonna need. And you know, I'm getting you an accommodation letter and they would, have, they would quip with that. I would make sure that that letter was written that day. I would go stand at the Office of Disability Resources and get it written so that we had legal documentation that they signed off on on all the accommodations that we're going to receive. But you absolutely, because you got a D and you a, a B, excuse me, excuse me, and you think you deserved an A, I think you should. I think you should fight that and try to retake the course. Yeah, I think the grade you got is irrelevant. Yeah, it's totally right? irrelevant. I mean you know, I was, I, I guess I don't know, but I was under the impression that, you know, there's basically some legality issue, right? That, that, you know, at, at least at my university, if, if we're, if you're, you have to do what's in the accommodation letter. It's not a Absolutely. choice, right? I guess I've never followed up on what the consequences of ignoring it would be, but, but this sounds horrible to me. And, yeah. you know, I, I think this is a major problem because I suspect that, whoever this professor is, is this, you know, if they ever get another student with an accommodation letter, they're, they're not going to be better. So that's, yeah. That's I, a huge I, problem. I mean, like, it's not uh, what, even the professor, not the issue, but I went in, like, in the higher of the professor, because, you know, like, uh, Dr. Toby said, like, you go higher, but unfortunately, how much you go higher, you find people who have fixed mindset about people with disability. Yeah. And this is the issue. It's not yeah. um, like yeah. I, I I worked with Dr. Nick. Dr. Nick, she's my professor. I worked with her. Yeah. Like I took like six classes or something. Like we never have an issue because she's understand and, and she's phenomenal professor. And like you know, she like we sit and talk. How as you mentioned, how we can solve the uh, the problem together? Not just oh, Dr. Nick, you need to fix this one. No. But there are, how much you go higher, you find people, even they don't want to see people with disability. Yeah, so I guess I, one thing that occurs to me is, you know, a lot of universities now, if they didn't before, have a, a like a, a diversity, equity, inclusion office or program or provost or vice provost. Um, I don't know if that's true at your university, but mm -hmm. that's, I think, where I would go because that's clearly... Uh, unless something has gone really wrong, that that's someone who's going to uh, understand the problem and and probably be an advocate. But again, I'm not. I, that's not a universal thing. Yeah, we do have that at UT, and I think that another concern that Kasai was mentioning was. Oh, by the way, I did not ask. I did not tell him to say such nice things about me. But um, I would say that another problem that he highlighted was this professor was comparing. Um, a previous blind student to yeah. him that and that's work. a yeah that's that's also an issue so well it makes me worry about if that previous student would have done better mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. they probably didn't get their accommodations either right mm -hmm. and they just right. didn't they just didn't fight back yeah that's that's a really big problem that needs to get solved I mean those are that's there was an issue I, I don't want to get into details, but I had an issue at, at Davis where I was compared to someone in a wheelchair. And it's just, you can't compare these things. Mm -hmm. And we, we went to the, to the right people and solved it. You know what I'll tell you is this is one of the main reasons that I went to Davis for both my undergraduate and graduate studies. I was actually encouraged by some people to go to a different university and for, for two reasons. The first one being that I absolutely wanted to stay in Dean's lab. Um, and, and work under, under Dean's advice, um, advising. But number two was that I knew people in the department and they knew me and I knew they were reasonable, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, this is a really hard one that needs to get solved. It really needs to get solved. This is yeah. not, you know, if, if you go to the top and the top has a fixed, has a closed mind, that's not being a team player, I'm sorry. Yeah, and you know, 
I don't want to do an analysis of the university system in the U.S., but there are some issues with tenure. <laughs> um, sure. But what I would say is that, you know, uh, keeping quiet, you know, even if 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 your your situation wasn't resolved, the fact that you reported it and there's a trail of it, you know, means that if it happens again, it'll probably be taken more seriously. It shouldn't you shouldn't have to wait for it to happen multiple times. But if no one says anything. Mm -hmm then it's hard, you know, people are, are easy to give someone the benefit of the doubt and write it off as a one-time thing. So it's, even though it doesn't necessarily help you directly, I think it's very good that you've, you created this sort of paper trail of, of the event that hopefully will help at least other people in the future. I think you should try to retake the class personally and get the grade you deserve. Well, I, I, I left the, the institution I was studying with, uh, and uh, I left it right now and study at the University of Texas, and yeah, so. Yes, yeah. this did not happen at UT Austin. Yeah, Hopefully. Good. <laughs> good. <laughs> but I do want to say, to like that question, I just, um, I love how much passion Everyone on the panel was like, I think you should do this. This is what should happen. I mean, there was just so much investment in that question. And I think that that also speaks to kind of like what we're talking about here is this dedication and investment in making sure that everything is kind of ex inclusive, accessible, um, and really taking these unique examples as serious, like something that we need to be paying attention to. And I just... I just loved seeing that. I just like sat back and I was like, whoa, like this is great. Um, awesome. So we have about 13 minutes. There was a question uh, from someone who asked, so Dr. Tentil mentioned pedagogy papers that he and Dr. Wedler have written and they have requested uh, for those papers or citations. And I believe yep. that Dean has sent those. Yep, as soon as I saw that, I, I sent them all to Nick awesome. at PDFs and she can share them as she sees fit. I will Thank share you. them widely, yes, <laughs> yes. So oh, we, have, awesome. <laughs> we have about 12 minutes left. Um, I don't see any additional questions right now, um, but is there anything else that you all would kind of like to leave us with uh, before we end any remaining thoughts. I know we had talked about before on our previous call, we had talked a little bit about the, the app Be My Eyes. That's something that you all want to talk about, but this is the, the last 10 minutes before, before we close the session. Dr. Nick, can I ask a question to the Dean? Mm -hmm. Dean? Yeah. 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 Just to be clear, I'm not a Dean. I just am Dean. <laughs> I'm Dean. Okay, I, so I don't want an administrative position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <Sorry, yeah>. good. <laughs> so you mentioned that like before, Dr. Toby, you, you, you didn't like work with the blind um, students, but do you like, did you have any of like family member or neighbor before worked with uh, Dr. Toby? No, no, actually no. Yeah. Um, so Hobie pointed out we met in, when was it, 2009, Hobie? We, we actually met in February of 06 when you subbed oh. for Tim Patton, and you ah. were amazing at describing, you were incredible at describing how team that, chemistry yes, then. Yeah. yeah, so I got to Davis in the summer of 2003, um, so there wasn't that big of a gap between uh, running into Hobie, but I didn't have any experience uh, working with a blind student or, or didn't even really know anyone uh, in my close network that was blind. Mm. Okay. He was just always, always had such an open mind. It was like, oh, let's do this. Okay, there's a blind student in this class that I'm subbing for. I'm going, I'm filling in for, I'm gonna do my very best to describe these things, you know? And Dean, for the record, from that day forward, wedges and dashes have always been known as wedgies and dashes. <laughs> it's a chemistry thing. It's a chemistry thing. <laughs> Another inside joke. Yeah. <laughs> what I, you know, I, you mentioned the um, the be my eyes thing, Nick. But I, I guess it would, I would like to hear Hobie say a little bit on how the process of of getting new technologies to blind and visually impaired 
people. I know we've talked a bit about this before, Hobie, and the, the particular difficulties in that. Maybe you could say a little on that. Uh, yeah, Dean, I just want to clarify and understand it, the difficulties in in, um, in in accessing materials and how technology I mean, might help that. Well, I mean, uh, so you and I have talked before about how it's hard. There is a lot of technology that wouldn't be too hard to create, but yeah. it's not created because it's viewed as a small market and right. Um, yeah. And therefore not a big money maker, right? Is that yeah. is that situation any better than the last time we talked about it? It's I mean, I think it's always I think as technology revolutionizes itself and, and grows, it's always improving a little bit. But I'll give you guys a good example. Apple, um, in my opinion, is a, a very progressive company and um, they're uh, pulling out my very old uh, iPhone um, uh, what is this SE that it's really the old one with the headphone jack. I just don't want to buy a new phone. Works fine. I don't need a big screen. The uh, iPhone is the most accessible tool I've ever used out of the box. So it doesn't, you know, even the the, the newest, latest, and greatest uh, model of iPhones that have no buttons on the screen. There are techniques to to navigate those phones effortlessly and do everything that a sighted person can do, as someone with no eyesight at all. And you know, it would be so great if other companies that that utilized touch screens and LED lights and this sort of thing would think about how to make those accessible much like, um, much like Apple has done. I'll give you a great example. I bought a washer and dryer set when I was, it's not something I enjoy doing by the way, shopping for washers and dryers, but I did it when I moved and uh, found a set that was, you know, that had more buttons than most. But one of the biggest challenges with this new tech, a lot of these new technologies is that you're, you're limited to uh, touch screens and little LEDs that show when things are on and off and every button that you push beeps but it doesn't tell you what it's what it's doing so I have in this set that was designed by Samsung the washer when you turn it on always resets to the the default settings the dryer turns on to exactly where the last person who was using it had it set so I never know how my dryer is set um, and, and it's just it would be so simple, something that, that is so simple that would help everybody. I'm sure Dean and Eric and, and Nick and, and everybody on this call would agree that it would be nice if you didn't have to look at your dryer every time and see how it was set previously by the, you know, by some other member of your household. So it would help everybody by fixing one one small thing. I think that's a really, really good question, Dean, that you that you, yeah, you know, Hobie, I've had a similar experience because, as you know, I, I teach in Taiwan every year. Right. And so I've done laundry on a washer that only had Mandarin characters on it. Right. Um, That's really and, hard. You know, it's not exactly the same, but it's hard to, to know like, what I'm actually doing and why is this taking six hours? I don't think I said it for six hours. But, you know, it's another one of those things. A, a universal design approach would help us both in doing our laundry. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's so interesting, and, and it really, you know, I, I think it, uh, I think it's just good to to be advocates and and stewards of encouraging the the market to think more more broadly and a little more abstractly about this stuff. I do want to, I do want to just just close my my little portion with with one remark, and then I want to open the floor to, to Dean and Eric for sure. Um, I think the biggest thing that that I would I would say is that everything in life is a challenge, and you're not going to know how that challenge is going to resolve. Everything is a journey. I didn't know how I was going to get a PhD when I started on December, uh, September 20th, around there of 2011. I remember standing at the welcome graduate, first year graduate student party going, yeah, I have been here for a few years at Davis, but I don't know how the heck we're gonna do this. I guess we'll figure it out. And you figure it out as you go, you know? So, so take that challenge everything in life is a challenge, but also take responsibility. Don't let other people do things for you because it doesn't feel as fun when things go right if you don't get to do them for yourself. And it's frustrating. I don't want to have to blame someone else for my failures. I don't want to have to blame someone else if my peer-reviewed journal article doesn't make it into the journal. It's my fault, right? And you're often writing with co-authors and, and you know, Actually, it's, it's, it's always all reviewer number two's fault. It's always reviewer number two. I, I love that. But, but aside from taking taking everything as a, considering everything as a challenge and accepting those challenges with with excitement, just remember to be positive. I think now more than ever, you know, 
it's a weird time that we live in. We've got good people all around us. Embrace those people. Be optimistic. You know, it's, it's, there's no sense in, in not being positive and loving whatever parts of life there are to love. You know, God, that got me through a lot of a lot of my career and, and still does to this day. It's like, I don't know how it's going to work. We're going to figure it out. But let's not be negative about it. It's easier I said than done. I second those, that. Those are some beautiful closing remarks, Hobie. <laughs> Certainly true for everyone. Not <laughs> broad spectrum of all humanity should take all that to heart. Do you like to say anything? I mean, I feel like that's a really horrible to have to follow up to yeah. that. <laughs> but would I? Well, maybe I'll just like... piggyback on it slightly and, and just say that... Um, I mean, it's important for all of us to remember that you don't need to have everything working and everything perfect to make progress. Um, so I, I think it's, I just wrote an essay about this, about how I, my career has basically been me being bad at things, but pushing things forward, <laughs> right? And so awesome. I think that, um, I think that's important to remember for all of us that you don't have to have everything in place to make it work perfectly. Uh, in order to progress forward. I guess that's what I would say. I didn't say that as eloquently as Hobie would have. No, but that's beautiful. That's my, that's my final thought. <laughs> uh, no more final thoughts from me. I'm sorry. Those are all <laughs> absolutely brilliant from both of my colleagues. <laughs> I completely agree. We are living in a weird time. It is always reviewer two's fault. Um, <laughs> But I, I just, yeah, I think those are some just really lovely parting words to kind of think of. And I think, again, that's for so many different different folks uh, to kind of take to heart. So I would like to thank all of our panelists for joining me today. It's been a long journey to get here and um, we have recorded the session. So there are lots of folks who have actually requested the recording um, because of the double Zooming happening. Um, so this will be shared over and over again. And I just, it's been a pleasure talking to you, the science guys here. They are always a pleasure to talk to, but just hearing their stories and sharing their thoughts. I just really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Thank you to our ASL interpreters very much for interpreting this whole panel for us. Thank you so, so much. And thank you to our captioner, who's just been amazing and has been on many Zooms that I've been on. And I just really, really appreciate her doing that. And then finally to our admin, Kate Jones, who is the person in the background keeping me sane most of the time. So thank you so much, um, Kate. So I am going to end it here and thank you for, for joining us on this panel. Yeah, thank you so much for having thank us. Thank you all. Thank Absolutely. you all so much. Delightful. Nick, if you don't mind,